Welcome to Tabernacle Baptist Church. We're thrilled that you joined us here this morning. Uh, I want to open us in a word of prayer that we might worship our Lord well together. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us day after day. Father, though the circumstances may be challenging, you remain the same. You are in control. You are in the heavens doing whatever you please, and you are good. And we want to return thanks to you for all of that this morning. So we love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Let's worship our Lord in song. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man will dare to stand before your throne, before the Holy One of Heaven. It's only by your blood and it's only through your mercy, Lord, I come. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man would dare to stand before your throne, before the Holy One of Heaven. It's only by your blood. And it's only through your mercy, Lord, I come. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you do. Oh, Lord, I bring an offering to you. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh, Lord, I bring an offering to you. Oh, Lord, I bring an offering to you. Oh, Lord, I bring an offering to you. Jesus the King. 
Our scripture reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 through 49. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Display for all to see. You are light, you are light. When the darkness closes in, you are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace. When my fear is crippling, you are true. You are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy. You're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life. In you, death has lost its sting. Oh, I'm running to your of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world 
thankful for this opportunity to, to be here with you, um, worshiping our Lord together. I, I know that um, you know, we, we think about it a lot and uh, how out of control everything is in the world, and we're just waiting for the next directive or the next bit of information to hopefully help us feel a little better about our situation, or at least to know what, where we're going. And um, I'm thankful that, that we have a God who knows our next step. Uh, we don't have to um, wonder what it is because he's in control. And uh, right now, I just want to pray for our offering. And uh, let's pray right now. Lord, we thank you for, uh, for your sovereignty. We thank you for your uh, omniscience. And we thank you for loving us um, it's humbling to think that the God of the universe wants us to come to you in prayer. Um, right now, I just want to uh, give everyone an opportunity to um, be led to give to you a little bit of what you've given to us already. Uh, everything that we have is yours. And um, our future, our 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 lives going forward uh, is all in your control. We pray that um, we can find peace and comfort in you and giving thanks right now in uh, just giving back a little bit of what you've given to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you again for tuning in this week. We appreciate having you along uh, with us as we open the Word of the Lord together. Uh, it's always interesting uh, what a given week would bring forth, and uh, believe it or not, this given week brought forth the building of a compost pile uh, over at my house. And uh, yes, this actually was by design, uh, not, not by accident. And, and as I was uh, thinking through building it, I, I was watching some YouTube videos on, you know, how to make the best compost pile. Uh, I know that, that's my entertainment here. Say what you will about it. But uh, I thought, you know, we could, we could do something with this. And so we had this little uh, five-gallon bucket, and that became a, a compost pile. It was as glorious as it may be, there were better things afoot. And so I, I had to call one of my friends and say, hey, can I, can I scrounge up some spare pallets that you might have? And he was good enough to let me do it. And so I, I got these spare pallets, and I made this compost pile. It's, it's got a couple of bins in there, and, and things are looking good. My daughters are helping me, and, and there's better things afoot, right? And so this is starting to get better and better. And then what would you say if I stopped right there? Well, that's wonderful to have a compost pile, but did you ever pause to reflect that the point of a compost pile is not, in fact, a compost pile? That, that this is simply one stage or one element, one aspect of, of a bigger picture, right? 
called gardening. How to garden. And, and that gardening has a little bit more to do with, say, photosynthesis than, than it does with making pallets stand up in your backyard. Now, composting is good, but it's part of something bigger, something, something better. So it is as we come to the Bible. And a lot of times we get lost in the compost pile, as it were, uh, namely that we're looking for, well, how to have a better marriage. We're looking for how to raise our kids. We're looking for how to solve problems at work. And, and those are all good, but they're just aspects. It's just a part of something bigger, of, of a story that's grander, that's even more glorious. N- not just how to garden, but how to live, how to be rightly related to God. And, and the point is nothing short of life itself. And that is what we're going to come to today in our text. If you have your Bibles, open to 2 Corinthians. We're in chapter 3 at this point, halfway through that chapter beginning at verse 7 and going all the way to the end of the chapter. And as we are in this text, thinking through really a big picture item, talking about this, this agreement that God has made with humanity, it's, it's the big picture, it's the, the how to garden text. Another story comes to mind. Now, I've, I've got a, a handful of daughters running around my house on a daily basis, and, and as I watch my girls, uh, I notice that they love playing with dolls. There, there are lots of mini babies. Most of them go by the name of Ariana. <laughs> go figure. And, and these babies sometimes become little girls who are getting married. And that's really fun to watch. And so uh, all my girls will take uh, rings and put them on the doll's fingers and walk them down aisles, and they're already thinking of, of marriage. And let me tell you, man, when my brother and I were young, it was not playing dolls and getting married. Boys and girls are different, are they not? And, and so here they are <laughs> getting married yet again, and there's nothing wrong with that, is there? In fact, it's wonderful, is it not? You could even look down at, at the games that they're playing and say, that's glorious. Sometimes the thought crosses my mind as a father. <laughs> it's, it's a glorious thing to watch your girls having fun. However, the glory of playing with dolls is not to be compared with the glory of walking down that aisle and, in fact, having a wedding day. Now, that is a glorious thing. And so with those ideas in mind, that this text is about the big story, not a part of the story, and that as you tell this big story, there's a comparison at work of one thing which is good and glorious to another thing which is better and more glorious, would you read along with me? I'm going to read a chunk of the verses right now, starting in verse 7. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters of stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Would you pray with me? Father, what a joy it is to pursue you in your word. And I pray that with the help of your Holy Spirit, you would open our minds so that we would understand what it is that the Spirit is saying to the churches, that we would follow you, that we would live lives of obedience based on what you measure out from your word. Lord, may we understand this agreement, this covenant that you have made. And Lord, may we enjoy the fruit of that covenant. I pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So here we are today speaking about a new covenant. And this first section of verses, we'll read one more section in a little bit here, really is speaking about the glory of the new covenant. And it's being compared with an old covenant. And I I need to set forth a couple of words before we get much further. The first being covenant. Now, last week we talked about this a little bit, namely that a covenant is an agreement. 
and it can be an agreement between, say, me and you, between you and a group of people. It, it, there's a number of ways it could be set up. In this case, we have an old agreement, which was set up with God and a group of people called Israel. It was a, a national covenant. Uh, there were ways that everyone on earth could be involved in this covenant. In fact, Israel was to be a kingdom of priests, a light to the world. And, and if you read the Old Testament, which is namely a written down covenant, you'll find that the people didn't do so well at living up to the letter of the law. That rather than being this light to the world that they might see Christ, they, they fell in many ways. In fact, most notably, they failed to really even understand that it was about Jesus Christ, failed to recognize the Messiah when He came. So covenant is an agreement. And when we talk about this old covenant, you, you start reading about it in verse 14. Excuse me. Turn a page and that's going to help. You start reading about it in verse 7, uh, which says that the ministry of death. And this word ministry is actually the same word that we get our word deacon from. So this diaconate, uh, this ministry, some translations would say this dispensation uh, or this administration. It's, it's the way of doing business, right? So, in the old way of doing business, this old ministry, it, it could be described in a certain way, namely, that this was a ministry of death. Now, those are strong words, because if you read the Old Testament, there's actually any of a number of places where it talks about keeping the law and living. And if you would have been, say, a Pharisee at this time, or, or say, someone who was uh, very familiar with the Old Testament, then these words of the Apostle Paul would have been shocking to you. You would have said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You would think that the Mosaic law was one of, of life, right? I've set before you two choices, life and death, so choose life. And yet here it's described as a ministry of death. Let me explain that a little bit. Uh, a verse that might be familiar to you goes like this. The wages or the price tag, the penalty, the wages of sin is death. That alone is enough to understand how this could be a ministry or, or an agreement that results in death. The wages of sin is death. Well, that being said, you, you look at this and the law revealed what was sin. Why is it a ministry of death? Because law upon law, line upon line, your sinfulness is being revealed to you. You will have no other gods before me. Well, you might say, I aspire to keep that commandment. And yet, upon reflection, realize that your heart is an idol-producing factory. And that you go about week by week spinning out these idols. And, and that these idols maybe take different shape in your life. And that you may not have a graven image, but yet in your heart of hearts you would just as soon serve money or popularity as the one true God. Well, you should not do that. And the law reveals these things about you. See, there's a problem, though, because you and I and the people of Israel as well, they, they redefine these laws down to their level. So, for instance, you should not have any gods before me. We take that and we're like, well, yeah, I can do that. And if I hand out a, a paper, you're like, yeah, check. Jesus is my one true God. And don't take my name in vain. And we're like, yeah, check, because I haven't used that one particular swear word. Never mind that you're taking his name and kind of using it in such a common way. When God talks about honor your father and mother, you, you redefine that in a certain way. When he, when he talks about not having adultery. You redefine that in a certain way so that lust isn't even part of the equation. And then you read Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, and Jesus says, you completely missed it. That if you regard a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with her in your heart already. And that makes you an adulterer at heart. The spirit of the law, the actual law, had a whole lot more to do with your heart's orientation towards God. And, and we're trying all that we can do to redefine it down <laughs> and simultaneously redefine our works up to the point that we can meet it. 
and we feel good about ourselves. But the problem is that while we think we've redefined the law down, the law remains inflexible. James chapter 2 says that if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you're guilty of all. Think of the 10th commandment. Don't covet. Don't have this desire in your heart for other people's things, whether it's for other people or whether it's for their possessions or I wish my house was as big or as nice or as fancy as that one's house. Well, that's coveting. Stop. And you say, that's hard to stop. Yeah, I know. So you could keep the law 99.99% of the time and offend in one point. And God says, look, you're a lawbreaker. You don't go to court and say, Your Honor, I I know I I did this really bad thing, and as a result, I've murdered somebody. But you wouldn't believe how good I am about not getting parking tickets. I am awesome about that. How is that going to hold up in court? You're a lawbreaker. You broke the law, and it remains inflexible towards you. So it is right here. The problem is we've all sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. That's what Romans 3.23 tells us. So because of that, it's a, it's a ministry of death. And as we keep reading, we understand that this ministry of death was on hardened hearts. So, so watch what it says here as we continue through verses 7 and 8. This ministry of death carved in letters of stone. Think the Ten Commandments. Think Moses. It came with such glory that the Israelites couldn't even gaze at Moses' face because of the glory which was being brought to an end. I I just need to pause right there, and this takes us back to Exodus 34. And really, we could go back to Exodus uh, 19 and 20. And and remember, when, when the law was given to Moses the first time, that there was thunder and lightning on the mountain and and that the people beholding all of this manifestation of the glory of God, they were shaking and they said, Lord, we we don't want to go up. Moses, you go up. We'll stay apart. And as they stayed apart, Moses went up and it was a while that he was up there, recall, 40 days. And the people again turned to their false gods. Aaron makes a golden calf. Moses comes back down, breaks the tablet, and there's disaster in the wings. (laughs) Take two. Now you come to Exodus 34. He goes back up again, and and he meets with the Lord, not not shying away, but drawing close to him. God, hiding him in the rock, passes by that Moses would only see his his back, his train, the, the, the last vestiges of his glory. I'll only make my goodness pass before you, Moses. And the result of that is that when Moses came down, he was radiant reflecting the Lord's present. And and the people were terrified of this. Aaron himself, the high priest, is like, put a veil on. It's just too much because it's a dangerous thing for such glory of the Lord to be in the midst of a sinful people who can look on the glory of the Lord and live. And so Moses veils his face, frankly, as a mercy that these hard-hearted, sinful people would not be more culpable with greater accountability for the way that they wrongly interacted with the glory of the Lord. God's glory may yet harden hearts and soften them. The same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. How will you respond to such glory? Now, notice that this law, this ministry of death, this which was carved in stone, this which interacted with the hardened hearts of the people of Israel was nonetheless temporary in nature. Uh, It says right here, actually in a number of places, but in verse 7, it was being brought to an end. Now, I'm going to actually skip a couple of portions as we go through this first paragraph and then come back to them and talk about the new covenant in a minute. So I'm going to skip verse 8. But notice at verse 7, it was being brought to an end and all of these things, say for instance verse 10, in this case, that which once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of that which surpasses it. Why? Verse 11, it was being brought to an end. 
So all of this is to say that this ministry of death, this old covenant, it was temporary in nature. Verse 9 tells us this. Yes, it was a ministry of death, but also it was a ministry of condemnation. Now, this should be clear to us by now, that because the law revealed sin, it served to condemn sinners. Well, the law itself was good. It was holy. It was righteous. We could see this in a variety of places in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, the same one who is talking about it in this way, also calls it good and holy and righteous in other places. The problem is we don't have the Holy Spirit in our hearts in this old covenant. So, this covenant is glorious. It's not as though God's glory is somehow less in the Old Testament than in the New. He is the glorious God. It is as though there is no Holy Spirit indwelling the believer in the Old Testament. But now in the New, things change. See, the Old Testament was glorious. This New Covenant, however, is more glorious. Now go back to verse 8. It says this, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Now, just as we kind of teased out what this ministry of death meant, I want to do the same thing here as we talk about this ministry of the Spirit. And if, if you look through a couple of verses, I think this will really help us out. Uh, there's going to be more verses with each of these, but at least this will give you a little peg to put your hat on, so to speak. Do, go back a chapter. Uh, this is chapter 1, verse 22. It says this, that God in Christ has anointed us, and has also put His seal on us and given us His Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. You may, if you've been around church for any length of time, have heard people talk about the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. It's a good phrase. And this verse, along with others, say from Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, and others still, talk about how God Himself takes up residence in the heart of those who believe on Him. Well, that's marvelous because if I am possessed by the Holy Spirit, I am therefore enabled to do what the Spirit calls me to do. Well, because of that, Romans 8.26 talks about how He, he understands our weakness and He intercedes with us, especially if you read uh, some verses following verse 26 in Romans chapter 8 there. He, he, he intercedes with groanings too deep. Sometimes we don't even know how to pray as we ought to pray, right? Maybe now is a great example of that where you're going through week after week thinking, oh, Lord, where's my next paycheck coming from? Maybe you filed for unemployment, and, but you can't even file maybe some of you. And you're saying, Lord, please help. And the Spirit makes groanings too deep for us to understand. He's interceding on your behalf. Maybe it's more than just the physical realities around you. It's the spiritual realities around you. And you're struggling to draw near to God. The Spirit intercedes on your behalf. And by the way, when you're thinking about what it means to draw near to God, understand that if you're a Christian, there's a sense in which you're as near as you can ever be. The very living God dwells within you. So when we talk about being near to God, really what we're talking about is, is us turning our soul back to Him, repenting. If you find that you are, quote, far from God, guess who moved? And guess what the solution would be? That being said, the, the Spirit helps us understand these things. In the first letter that Paul wrote to this church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 10 through 16, there, there's a beautiful passage there that talks about uh, an unregenerate person or, or a natural person does not understand the things that he reads. Case in point, you can read unregenerate, unsaved people who are not Christians with doctorates on the Word of God talking about how Jesus is just a mere man. What a sad state of affairs. You can read really smart people. It's not that they don't know anything. It's that they have no basis for knowledge or that they have misapplied that knowledge. And, and here's all this effort on the Word of God, and yet they just don't see it because the Holy Spirit opens our eyes. 
So if you today are saying, oh, Lord, please teach me, please reveal to me, that is a marvelous prayer. If you, on the other hand, have this high view of yourself and with a calloused heart are proceeding and upon occasion even reading the Word, that's a dangerous thing. God resists the proud, but He's very gracious to those who are humble. The Spirit opens your eyes. He, he illumines your heart, your mind, that you could understand what is read and, and what is written in this Word. That being said, this new covenant is the ministry of the Spirit, but it's also called this in verse 9, a ministry of righteousness. For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. That this old covenant was, was very useful, very fruitful to reveal who we were and, and, and how we fell short and therefore condemnatory in nature. This new covenant, because the Holy Spirit dwells within, is marvelous. It's a ministry of the Spirit and therefore it results in righteousness. That God is righteous, Romans 3, to forgive us. And God is righteous to make us righteous. We call this justification. It's this act of God declaring us righteous. This covenant is all about you now having a right standing with God and you being enabled to rightly do the things that He has called you to do. It's a ministry of righteousness. And while the old one was being done away with, this new covenant is permanent. Verse 11 says this, If what was being brought to an end came with glory, how much more? Will that which is permanent have glory? We say this often uh, at this church, that once you're saved, you're always saved. That when God says eternal life, He means what He says. And verses like this and others help us understand that, that, that we have such a hope because we hope in such a God. That it's not determinative on what I do, but it's of Christ from beginning to end. All of this is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We'll get to there in verse 18. So here we see a new covenant made permanent because it's not dependent on what we do. It's dependent on what God does. And because of that, you read verses 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, and you hear words like, it's glorious and more glorious, and it's exceedingly glorious, and it's a surpassing glory. This is a glorious truth. With that in mind, we don't want to simply talk about the glory of the new covenant, but the hope that you and I have as followers of Jesus Christ because of this new agreement that God has with us. That being said, let me read this and then go into it. So verse 12 says, since we have such a hope. Now that's clearly referring back to what we've just read. We have such a hope, namely this permanent uh, indwelling of the Spirit, this permanent state of being made righteous in God's eyes. Well, we're very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, Whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Well, this is a covenant of hope. So what is your hope? If your hope is in anything less than this Lord of glory who has this covenant with you, then it is an inferior hope. It would be a temporary hope as opposed to this permanent one. But if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ alone, then you have this hope, and then this hope has certain results. Namely, verse 12, we are bold. Now, does that describe you? I think sometimes 
the righteous are as bold as a lion, right? Isn't that what Proverbs says? I think sometimes that that we may be more bold than we act. Maybe a little bit like Gideon. Do you remember Gideon? He, he's in a wine press kind, kind of hiding out, and, and he's kind of doing some things, and yet the angel of the Lord approaches him, and, and he talks about him being a mighty man of valor. And you, as you've been reading the story, might look at Gideon and say, really, do tell because I didn't see that in the text yet. And yet God sees something about him that he does not yet see of himself. Maybe this verse describes you in such terms, that you are very bold because of what Jesus Christ is doing in you. Now, would you act in accordance with the character that Christ has put in you? What can you do today that is bold for Christ? Not foolishly bold, not, oh, I'm going to go out and do this crazy thing. That's not at all what we're talking about. Put this in context of the larger text. Go back to chapter 1, chapter 2. The Apostle Paul has been explaining to this church at Corinth why he wrote this severe letter rebuking their sin. And that it was, in fact, in love that he wrote this letter because he wants them to understand all the truth of Jesus Christ and that he, as this apostle, is sometimes misunderstood, but nonetheless very bold. And you, in the same way, can be very bold in love that always goes together. In love, in grace, you speak the truth in love. And yet you're able to do this because of the hope that's in you. Not because of your uh, wonderful pedigree in speech. Not because of your great bank of popularity. Not because you're so well accepted. No, because you have hope in Jesus Christ. Because He is the one who is counting you worthy and competent and sufficient. He's the one who's at work in you. If you have other standards of comparison, you will probably lack this boldness or not have biblical boldness. It'll, it'll morph into something like brazenness or a caustic speech. That's not what it's calling us to do. Rather, it's, it's a type of boldness that is not like Moses. What we mean is, We're not veiling our words as Moses veiled the glory. We're being bold with the words of Christ. But now, let's talk about Moses. Verse 13 says this, We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Now, we touched on this in the last paragraph, didn't we? And we alluded uh, pretty specifically, actually, to Exodus 34, and we reminded ourselves that really the Israelites had hardened hearts. It's not as though Moses had a deliberate desire to shut the people of God away from the presence of God. It rather is as though these people, these Israelites, were embracing a sinful way of life and recognizing just how disparate it was from this glory of God that was now right there in their midst. Maybe another way to talk about verses 13, 14, 15 would be to remind ourselves of this passage at the end of chapter 2 in which Paul says, we smell like Jesus Christ. And to the one, it's life unto life. But to the other, it smells like death. So it was with Moses. And he came down and the people are terrified of this. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Well, why? Verse 14. Their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil, that which obscures sight, remains unlifted. Because only through Christ it's taken away. Yes. To this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. And it reminds us of Romans 9 and 10 and 11 talking about this hardening of the hearts that's happened. Uh, Maybe some of you have friends who you love dearly, who are familiar with the Old Testament, maybe who go to synagogue that read portions from the Old Testament and yet fail to realize that when you read about the tabernacle, it points to Jesus Christ. That when you read about these sacrifices, it points to a substitute who could take the place of the sinner, and that Jesus is the substitute, that when you read Isaiah 53, 
Jesus was the one, my suffering servant, led like a lamb to the slaughter. With all of these pointers to Jesus Christ and, and many more, boy, pointers to his birthplace, to his type of death, to his ministry. There's, there's a, a great light, Galilee of the Gentiles, where most of his ministry happened. All of these texts point to Jesus Christ. And yet there's a, a hardening of their minds. Nonetheless, not only has that mind been hardened, but for some, the mind has been unhardened, or the veil has been lifted. Now look with me at verse 14 and at verse 16. Yet yeah, their minds were hardened, but dot, 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 only through Christ is that veil taken away. Skip down a couple of verses. Verse 16, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. There is only one way. It's only through Christ that someone's hardened mind, hardened heart, can be unhardened or softened. There is, in fact, one way to have peace with God, and it's through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved, Acts 4.12. Jesus said it, didn't he? I am the way. No one gets there. No one gets saved. No one has this fellowship with the Father except through me. I am the truth. By the way, did you ever ask yourself, what is truth? It's interesting. Some of our uh, Islamic friends would maybe have this as a point of entrance. And Jesus is saying, I am the truth. Well, truth is that which has fidelity to the original. What's the original? Isn't that the Father? Isn't that God himself? Jesus is claiming yet again in yet another way, he is very God of very God. John 10, I and the Father are one. We serve the triune God. And it's only through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that you can have life and peace with God. Only through Christ. Verse 17 is beautiful. We, we repent, verse 16. We turn to the Lord. And then in 17, we have this freedom as a result of this. I, I guess maybe I'm going too fast, and I, I want to pause for a moment and say that when we talk about repentance, it's not simply I feel bad about something. It's not simply a desire in your heart. You read Proverbs, and it says that the soul of the sluggard is filled with craving all the day long. But he doesn't have anything because he has not acted on it. You may be sitting here hearing these words saying, boy, I, I feel so badly about the sin that's in my life. I feel so badly about these things that I have done. Well, what will you do about it? Will you give your life to Jesus Christ? Jesus says it this way, follow me. Jesus says it this way, stop living for yourself. That if anyone would come after me, he must take up his cross daily. Say it another way. He must deny himself. Say it another way. He must hate his father and mother and wife and brother and sister, his children, his own life also, and follow me. Obviously not in the strict, literal sense of, great, I always did hate my family. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. But in a sense, very similar to this passage. Like the old covenant has no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. Same idea. That the love that you have for your family, and that's precious love, is it not? Would look like no love at all because of the love that you have for your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, that's repentance. And if you change your mind about God, then, of course, you'll begin living for God. If you change your mind about your sin, then, of course, sin looks ugly, not beautiful. You begin to live differently because of those things. Now, because you begin to live differently, well, there's freedom, isn't there? That's what verse 17 says. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. By the way, we serve the triune God. Is this the Lord, Jesus Christ? Or is this harking back to Exodus 34, the Lord, namely Yahweh? Well, I mean, yes, right? We serve the triune God. The Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Isn't this good? That you have freedom from 
the bondage of sin. You have freedom from the penalty of sin. You have freedom from the law. And yet, because the Spirit is in your heart, you love His law. And you realize that, wow, when I honor my father and mother, that's a beautiful thing. Wow, when I love my wife and love my children, that there's freedom in that. Freedom is not the absence of constraints. It's the presence of right restraint. Freedom is not anarchy. I get to do whatever I want to do. That will lead you to destruction and despair. No, it's understanding that now you get to do what God wants you to do. And in that is flourishing. With all that being said, we arrive at verse 18. In some ways, the crown jewel of this passage. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. All of us have this at work. All of us who are Christians, right? That there are some whose hearts are hardened who are not participating in this process that we've just described in verse 18. But we all who are partakers of this new covenant, we all have an unveiled face. Well, how does that face get unveiled? Read verse 14, read verse 16. Only through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That Jesus is very God of very God. You don't get to say, well, Jesus was a good person and participate in this covenant. You don't get to say, well, maybe Jesus was a God, but not the God, and get to participate in this covenant. That does not work. That you say, yes, Lord. Now we're talking. That's following Jesus. And that when you believe, you also behave, right? Faith and repentance. You don't have one without the other. And no, your works don't save you. We just talked about that in this condemnation because your works are not good enough. But Jesus can. And that's great news. So we all, with unveiled face, are, are beholding the glory of the Lord. So so unlike the Israelites who couldn't who couldn't and wouldn't gaze at Moses, we are gazing not at Moses, but at God. A- and and we are gazing and, and it's almost like we're gazing at God in, in this in this mirror. And as we behold him, that word for behold could also be translated reflect. It's almost like there's this this shift that as we're looking at God, we begin to look like God. That as we continue to, to behold Him in the glass, we now reflect Him in the glass, and we are being changed into that same image the glorious image of Jesus Christ, the resurrected one, the conquering one, that we are beginning to look like our Lord, our glorious Lord, the Lord of glory. And the word here is one you know. It's, it's and I'll spare you all the tenses, but metamorphosis. You know that, right? You learned it in fourth grade. Talk about caterpillars and butterflies and, and cocoons and, and how everything changes. That's the word used right here. You're being, may I say, metamorphed into the image of Jesus Christ, that yes, it's not quite right now. You might look a little more like a caterpillar than you care to admit. But there's good things coming. There's better things afoot. That, that as we sit here and, and had been playing with dolls, the wedding day has come. But you know what the good news is? The honeymoon's coming. That, that as good as the wedding day is, there's better things afoot. That you talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb as you read Revelation. That you talk about not just the wedding day, but the marriage. And you get to dwell for all eternity. Guys, there's better things afoot. We're being transformed into His image. Isn't this what Romans 12 talks about? Verse 1, I beseech you, because of the mercies of God, that you'd present yourself as a living sacrifice. Then you, you get to verse 2 and it says, don't. Don't be conformed. Don't have the schematics of the world as your outline for life. Rather, here's our word again, be be morphed, be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ by the renewing of your mind, says Romans 12, 2. Or, Or you can look yet again, Romans 8, 29, right? 
all these things work together for good. Isn't that good to remember right now? Quarantine works together for good. You bet. Yeah. I lost my job. That's good. Yes, for the purpose of conforming you into the image of his dear son. All of these things, yea, verily, even the hard things in life, even the bad things in life, even the you meant it to me for evil things in life, but God meant it for good that he could bring about much life as it is this day. You're being metamorphed into the image of Jesus Christ. Now that is glorious. It's from glory to glory. It's, it's glorious from the first to the last. It's a glorious thing that this is happening. God himself is glorious, and it is a glory in which I participate until the very day of my glorification. It's glorious from first to last. The whole thing is heavy. It's deep. It's weighty, and it's good. And all this is from the Lord who is the Spirit, from the Spirit who is the Lord, from the Spirit of the Lord. You can say that a lot of ways. We have a triune God. The Holy Spirit, by the way, is not a force. He is very God of very God. And he is the one at work in you to enable you to participate in all of the good fruit of this new covenant. Now, what a text. I want to ask you a few questions here. With all of this in mind with this new covenant, why is it that so many people are tempted to rely on their good works? Pause and think about that. You are too. So am I. Where, where we think, you know, I'm, I'm good enough. Where, where we think, I, I'm, I'm courting God's favor because, well, look at what I do. Why is it that you're tempted to think that way? What is it in you that tempts you to rely not on the Holy Spirit? Here's kind of a companion question. How are you using good things? You know, the law is good. We're not going to come away from this message saying, and look what a bad thing the law was. That's not at all the point of this text. We began saying the law is glorious. And if this is glorious, how much more glory? That's the point. Well, there's good things that we use. Think of your spiritual routine. Think of maybe the spiritual disciplines, uh, the songs that you sing, the habits in your life, uh, the, the fact that you, you pray, all of these things. These are good things, aren't they? How are you tempted to use good things? Are you trying to manipulate God into blessing you? Maybe you could say that a little bit more clearly uh, in the reverse. Are you bitter? If your definition of blessing isn't what you're experiencing right now, even though you maybe went to church a lot, or if you didn't go to church and you broke that commandment, that is a command, by the way, right? Hebrews 10, 25. Uh, but here we are defining the law down again. No, I don't have to go to church. I'm good enough. Careful, lawbreaker. A and we're, we're sitting here trying to use these good things. Ah, I went to church a lot. I uh, honor God these various ways. And yet, right now, maybe you're in pain. Maybe your finances aren't what they ought to be. Maybe, maybe life just doesn't look how you think it ought to look, right? How do you use good things? If you're bitter against God, then odds are you're living under some form of the old covenant where you're saying, Lord, look at all I've done for you, therefore, could you do these things for me? And by the way, even that is not really a good description of the Old Testament. I mean, it's always been by grace through faith. Here's, here's another question for you. What would it look like in light of this hope that you have in Christ, in light of the fact that it's all about Jesus, in light of the fact that the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in you, what would it look like for you to live boldly and freely towards God and towards man? What, what sort of access would you avail yourself of towards God? What sort of speech would characterize your dialogue towards man? What would that look like for you? Maybe you could say this question this way. In what ways could I be a little more bold and a little more free? A little less bound and a little less cowardly? 
today. That's for freedom that He set you free. If the Son has set you free, you're free indeed. There's a lot of passages about freedom in Christ. It's a wonderful covenant that He gives to us. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. How will you love Him today? Let's sing together. God is able. Thank you again for joining us today. And I wanted to close us in a word of prayer straight from the text of Scripture. This is Jude, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever.